welcome everyone, uh, both those at home and those here with us. And we're glad you could be with us today for this special event. Uh, I want to introduce uh, Wes Vanderloot, who will be leading our time together for the next hour. Wes is an adjunct professor of theology uh, here at the Charlotte campus in Gordon-Conwell. Uh, he's also the lead pastor at Warehouse 242, a church here in Charlotte that uh, is, uh, has core commitments to creativity and to justice. He has a PhD in theology, imagination, and the arts from the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. He's a board member with CETA, Christians in Theater Arts, and the Lorian Academy of the Arts uh, here in Charlotte. As an adjunct faculty, he also does uh, regular speaking globally on the topic of theology, spiritual formation, and the arts, and the way those disciplines intersect. His publications include Living in Theodrama, Reimagining Theological Ethics. Wes lives here in West Charlotte with his wife, Stephanie, and their three children. And his wife, Stephanie, I understand as well, is involved with a Healing Justice. Uh, she's a, a Healing Justice Fellow with the QC family tree in the city. Wes, thank you so much for being with us today. We're grateful for this opportunity to learn and to be guided uh, by, by your expertise today. Oh, thank you so much, Jerry. It's a, truly an honor and a delight to be with you today as we celebrate and learn about some African-American art as displayed at the Harvey Gantt Center. Uh, so today, as we encounter this art together, it's important that you know I'm, I'm not doing this with you as an expert. Uh, I see myself as a co-learner with you as we receive this gift of art together. Uh, and I believe that art is not merely an object for disinterested contemplation. I believe that art is a um, huge gift to the church and to us individually as Christians and it has massive formative potential in our lives. If the spirit is at work in all of creation, which includes the makers of art and the, the works of art, then, then we must recognize that art has this potential to unself us in love and attention to others, to present truth slant in ways that uh, we haven't perhaps considered it before, to engage and shape our emotions, and to help us imagine new possibilities for beloved community and for life together in Christ. So for those of you who are not uh, familiar perhaps with the Harvey Gantt Center, it is one of the premier arts institutions in Charlotte. It's named after Harvey Gantt, who was the first African-American student to be admitted to Clemson University in 1963. He went on to get his master's in city planning from MIT, became an accomplished architect and Charlotte's first African-American mayor, serving for a couple terms in the mid eighties. So the Harvey Gantt Center named after Mr. Harvey Gantt is committed to presenting, preserving and celebrating excellence in the art, history and culture of African-Americans and people of African descent. The Gantt Center currently has two digital exhibits. One is called Welcome to Brook Hill. And the other is called A Woman's Work. I'm gonna be sharing my screen and getting us into those exhibitions right now. So for the sake of time, I'm only going to be walking us through one of these exhibits today. I've chosen a woman's work, which includes a wide selection of mediums and styles from African-American artists. But even though we won't be looking at Welcome to Brook Hill, I highly recommend that you do so on your own time, not just to appreciate the wonderful photography of Alvin Jacobs, uh, but to learn more about the, the history and the people of Brook Hill. Uh, Brook Hill is a small collection of affordable homes at Remount and, and South Tryon here in Charlotte. Uh, as Jacob shows through his photographs, uh, he shows that these people are beautiful and they are resilient. Um, and yet there is a story there of, of carrying this burden of prejudice, 
and stereotypes and, and potential displacement as well. So Brook Hill is beautiful and it matters because its people are beautiful and they matter. And uh, so does the place where they live and have built their community. Uh, the theologian Willie James Jennings has written powerfully on the connection between geography, racial injustice, and God's story of belonging and intimacy. Um, in his book, The Christian Imagination, Theology and the Origins of Race, he writes this. He says, for us in the racial world, the remade world, a crucial point of discipleship is precisely real estate. Where we live determines in great measure how we live. Our imaginations must be drawn to new possibilities of living arrangements that capture our freedom in Christ and turn them toward desiring a journey of joining enabled and guided by the Spirit of God. So there's huge potential for us as Christians as we engage with an exhibit like Brook Hill. I would encourage you to, to do that on your own. Uh, but for now, let's turn our attention to a woman's work, selections from the John and Vivian Hewitt collection of African-American art. The title slide of this exhibit says that a woman's work encompasses a multitude of women and their many roles, identities, and experiences. It places the focus of attention on the black woman as a center of family, as a sister, worker, and the epitome of womanhood. Interlaced with unwavering love, kinship, and perseverance, the works on display combine vivid imagery, light sketches, intricate patterns, and a sense of reality and wonder. There are 24 works in this exhibit, so what, in what follows, I hope to give you a little bit of background on the artists, uh, a little bit about each work, and do some theological engagement with this along the way as well. We begin with Head of a Woman by Elizabeth Catlett. Catlett was born in Washington, D.C., but early on in her career, she won a fellowship to work in Mexico, where she eventually became the head of the sculpture department at the National School of Plastic Arts in Mexico City. Uh, Catlett had some bold things to say about being a black woman in the arts, especially in the mid 20th century. She once said that no other field is as close to those who are not white and male as the visual arts. After I decided to be an artist, the first thing I had to believe was that I, a black woman, could penetrate the art scene and that further I could do so without sacrificing one iota of my blackness or my femaleness or my humanity. So Head of a Woman then is uh, intentionally centering the gaze and presence and strength of a black woman, which as Catlett recognizes has been a gap, not only in the art world, but also in theology as well. And along those lines, I would love to bring into conversation with this exhibit, the work of Shaniqua Walker Barnes and her book, I Bring the Voices of My People, A Womanist Vision for Racial Reconciliation, published by Erdman's in 2019. Shaniqua Walker Barnes is a clinical psychologist, a public theologian, a minister. Um, she's author of, of the book I just mentioned, as well as Too Heavy a Yoke, Black Women and the Burden of Strength and she serves as Associate Professor of Practical Theology at the Mercer University McAfee School of Theology in Atlanta. But in her book, I Bring the Voices of My People, it's a wonderful book, uh, Walker Barnes shows how women of color have been largely absent from movements and conversations about racial reconciliation, particularly in evangelical circles, which is the perspective she's writing from, um, and hence the need for what she calls a womanist vision of racial reconciliation. She explains a little bit what she means about that in her book. She writes, womanist theology begins its analysis by understanding the lived experience of African-American women. 
including the way in which they experience oppression and the ways in which they find hope and experience, uh, hope and exercise agency in the midst of oppression. Emerging in the 1980s as a reaction to black liberation theology and feminist theology, womanist theology privileges black women's lives as texts, sources of authority that can tell us something about the nature of God and about the nature of the human condition. It draws from a rich well of the beliefs, traditions, and practices that have enabled black women to make a way out of no way. So from that perspective, this whole exhibit can be read and appreciated and enjoyed from a womanist perspective. And so as Walker Barnes says at the end of her introduction, just sit a spell and let the women folk teach you something about the ways of the world. I should point out, however, that uh, although this, this work, this exhibit is all about black women as subject, many of the artists that we'll be looking at are actually African-American men, including this next painting. Girl with Flowers by Ernest Cricklow. Uh, Cricklow was a 20th century social realist painter, uh, was a part of the Harlem Renaissance, which was a movement centered in Harlem in the 1920s and 30s. It featured the intellectual and cultural revival of African-American music, dance, art, fashion, literature, theater, politics, uh, you name it. And the Harlem Renaissance is what laid the groundwork for the civil rights movement and, and a whole way of, whole new way of imagining black identity in America. We'll be seeing several of other, uh, other Cricklow works in the exhibit. They're not um, ordered by artists. And so we'll be coming back to some of these artists that we're being introduced to. Next is Untitled by James Denmark. Uh, Denmark, who's still active as an artist at 85 years old, living in Yemassee, South Carolina. Uh, Denmark was influenced by both the African-American experience, uh, but as well as the tradition of abstract expressionism as represented by Jackson Pollock, William de Kooning um, and others. He's especially known for the use of intense color and the improvisational practice of creating collages um, and even with his watercolors, which expresses the movement and the, the vibrancy of black culture. Um, his collages, which I would recommend you doing a, a little extra time, just enjoying those collages were um, inspired by his childhood experience of helping his grandmother cut patterns for her quilts. Um, and, and I think his collages in particular, but his watercolors as well, uh, is just a beautiful reminder for us of how the spirits work in our life. It's a matter of, of taking disparate experiences, relationships, places, influences, and stitching them and weaving them together into a story of grace and beauty and transformation. New Wave by Anne Tanksley is a, is a unique work of monotype. Um, like many African-American artists in the second half of the 20th century, Anne Tanksley was inspired by the seminal work of the black artists within the Harlem Renaissance. But in particular, Tanksley was inspired by the work of novelist and anthropologist Zora Neale Hurston. Um, and I think it's important that when it comes to understanding artists, sometimes we have this misconception that the artist is some kind of isolated genius who's creating things out of nothing with their imagination. But in reality, artists are always building off a tradition and they're gaining inspiration from other artists and, and other movements. In fact, a Christian theology of creativity recognizes that none of our creativity is original. Only God is the original artist who made beautiful things out of nothing. And so every subsequent act of creativity is derivative of that original act of creativity, which means that our acts of creativity and artistry are what Tolkien called 
sub-creation. We are sub-creators as we create and, and make art. And not only is our creativity dependent on God in that way uh, and, and our image bearing identity, but we are also dependent on each other and on the histories, communities and traditions in which we're embedded. And this is especially true in African-American artistic communities and traditions, given the, the common bond and experience of oppression, uh, injustice and, and perseverance in American history. And as such, it's really common for African-American artists to be inspired across uh, by each other, across various art forms and across various genres. So here, for example, we have Anne Tanksley. She's inspired by a novelist uh, who inspires her as a visual artist, who then maybe inspires a jazz musician, who inspires dancers, who inspire fashion designers, who inspire photographers, who inspire filmmakers, and, and around and around that circle it goes. Uh, I think that's beautiful. I think it's a beautiful picture of mutuality and um, beloved community that reminds us how the body of Christ has many members. And each of us are bringing our unique gifts to contribute and inspire each other and contribute to the, the beauty of God's mission and the Spirit's artful work of transformation in the world and in our lives. So going back to New Wave, uh, th this is a great example of Tanksley's monotypes. And a monotype is made by, by putting printer's ink or oil paint on a, a piece of glass or a piece of smooth metal, and then that's imprinted on a piece of paper. You really only get one good print per go, uh, hence the, the name monotype. Um, and here it's uh, printed, this is pressed onto red paper and that gives it a luminescent quality and it, it draws your attention in particular to the shapes and the lines and the waves in the painting, or in the print rather. All right, Two Generations by James Denmark, uh, another watercolor of his. Uh, this work is representative of the central role of black mothers in the preservation of tradition, preservation of family and culture, just the passing on of all that really matters to the next generation. Here's Waiting Number Two by Alvin Hollingsworth. Uh, it's a really important figure in um, later half of the 20th century of, of painting and, and figural painting. He was born in 1928 in Harlem. He's one of the first black artists to illustrate comic books and they had a very successful career as a comic book illustrator. Then he turned to fine art. And uh, so this exhibit features several of those works. And what Hollingsworth did is he wove themes of liberation and justice all throughout his work. One of his main themes being the liberation and the elevation of black women. So in Waiting Number Two and in, in other similar work that we'll, we'll see, Hollingsworth is presenting an alternative to the historical and artistic tradition called mammification. Uh, so mammification is basically the tradition of depicting women of color as servants, nurturers, or caregivers. Um, and Walker Barnes writes about this tradition. She says, the clearest example of this and the source of the term is the black mammy figure in the U.S. cultural imagination. Originating during the U.S. slaveholding era, the mammy was a romanticized depiction of enslaved black women that was used to justify slavery and to disguise its horrors. With that tradition in mind and in contrast to mammification, Hollingsworth portrays black women and black mothers in majestic rather than deferential or servant-like modes, still presenting them as mothers, but in a different way than the mammification tradition. Uh, you could say that his art, especially as it relates to black women, um, is all about the majestification of black women in contrast to that tradition of, of mammification. And we'll come back to that a little bit more, more of his art and some examples in a bit. 
Here is Family Number Two by John T. Biggers. Biggers was born uh, in 1924, actually in Gastonia, uh, just west of Charlotte. He eventually went to Hampton University where he studied under Elizabeth Catlett, who um, we saw as our, our first artist in the exhibit. Uh, Biggers was one of the first African-Americans, uh, African-American artists to receive a UNESCO fellowship that allowed him to visit Africa and to study all kinds of African traditions of art. And, and you'll see that influence very clearly in his work. Uh, this one, Family Two, in particular, it uses circles to show the, the intimacy and the belonging that transcends binaries of various kinds, whether male, female, two bodies that are in fact one flesh, dark and light, visible and invisible, human and divine. So you have these two figures that are separate, but they're joined, right? They're different, but they're united. They're two, but they're one. That's a beautiful picture of Christian marriage. Family number one does something similar. It's showing how intimacy generates this mysterious unity in the midst of difference. It's producing true community out of a collection of individuals, true family, true, true kinship. For me, although I'm sure this wasn't Bigger's full intention, there is a, a Trinitarian beauty to this print that makes us think about how it's possible for three to be one, for one to be three, to be joined together in an eternal dance of intimacy and belonging and community. This is the communion, of course, the, in, into which we are drawn by union with Christ. And that makes possible the kind of solidarity and belonging and intimacy uh, that, that is possible in a world of racial identities and divisions. Twins of Mourning, another one by Biggers, incorporates various symbolism of the African diaspora. Again, this is influenced by Biggers' time in Africa through his fellowship and, and other times in his life. For example, you have a, the prominent blacksmith's anvil that evokes the way in which various African cultures and identities have been shaped through fire, force, and fierce determination. Uh, they've been shaped uh, into a new identity here in America. Here's Hollingsworth again, who in contrast to the mammification of black women presents again a majestification of a black woman. And this is a beautiful example of this. The inscription says, washes of color outline the figures, pooling with greater intensity around the heads, including the forceful silhouette of a black woman. A favored motif that invests this figurative composition with specific meaning. And I'm describing that meaning as a, as a majestification in contrast to the mammification. Family Tree is also by Hollingsworth. Um, this work is showing the, the power of black families and black communities to bind together and to rise up in the midst of suffering and oppression. An interesting note about Hollingsworth is that together with Romare Bearden, maybe that name sounds familiar to you, uh, and William Majors and others, he helped form a group in 1963 called Spiral. Uh, this group had a mission to advance the civil rights movement through art, uh, mainly visual art. Um, and, and the name Spiral is a reference to the, the Archimedean spiral that moves outward and embraces all directions, yet continually upward. Um, and that is even represented here in Family Tree. Just a little side note, speaking of Romare Bearden, if you're ever in Romare Bearden Park in Uptown, you, you may have seen a, a massive and impressive and beautiful sculpture by Richard Hunt. Uh, it's called Spiral Odyssey. Um, and that is also a nod to the same collaborative 
uh, that Bearden helped form this arts group and the, the spiraling move toward the common goal of liberation as artists um, and as African-Americans. If you haven't seen that sculpture, highly recommend it. It's one of my favorite public artworks here in Charlotte. All right, back to an example from Ernest Cricklow. We already looked at Girl with Flowers. This is called The Sisters. Um, and this is also like his other work is playing with social realism and minimalism in this case. And the other thing that I think is going on in this work and other of, of Cricklow's works is that he is confronting the challenge of colorism. Uh, again, Walker Barnes is a helpful guide as we seek to understand the complexities of colorism. So she writes this. Rooted in European racial ideology, colorism confers privilege upon individuals and groups whose skin color, hair, and facial or body features more closely approximate whiteness. In many cultures, the association between light skin and social value began as a product of the association between class and outdoor labor. Individuals with class privilege being exempt from manual and outdoor labor tended to have a fairer complexion than did those from the lower economic, economic rung of society. And she explains, uh, goes on to explain how even in, in American white culture, we have several categories and labels that uh, could be described in, in a colorism kind of scheme. So um, redneck, for example, that ascribes a, a hierarchy to people based on the lightness or the darkness of, of skin and other characteristics. In fact, Walker Barnes points out that even prior to colonialism and slavery, Western Europeans associated lightness with civility, intelligence, purity, and beauty. In contrast, darkness was associated with dirtiness, evil, and ugliness. Uh, in fact, she writes, quote, the relationship between perceived skin tone and objective markers of social privilege is so strong that many scholars argue that skin tone is becoming more important than racial identity. So there's a lot of conversation about this uh, today. Uh, this, the whole debate around colorism, the problem of colorism is active in black culture, uh, but also in Asian culture, Latino culture, Indian culture. Um, and in each case, this framework of colorism stems from the diseased imagination of white supremacy. So in a work like The Sisters, it's really important and it's really beautiful because Cricklow is showing that the deep brown and the deep black skin color is truly beautiful, especially in contrast to these white garments and the, and the white background. And for us as Christians, it shows us, should help us um, appreciate the fact that God is not colorblind. We should not be colorblind, but like God, uh, love the, the richness and the, the depth of every skin color. Uh, in God's creation. Oops. All right. Next, we have a work by Jonathan Green. It's called Folding Sheets. Jonathan Green is still active as an artist in Charleston, and he is known as one of the foremost contemporary artists depicting Gullah culture. Uh, so Gullahs are African Americans who live in the low country regions of South Carolina and Georgia both the, the coastal plain and, and the, the Beaufort Sea Islands. And more than any other African-American community in the United States, the, the Galas are known for preserving their uh, African linguistic and cultural heritage. So that the storytelling, cuisine, music, fashion, folk beliefs, crafts, farming, fishing, all of those things. Uh, so here is, is a representation of some of that in his work, Folding Sheets. This is Bula's World by Earl Hill. Um, and this is a unique painting. It's uh, playing off, uh, as we talked about, many artists play off different traditions. In this case, 
Uh, this painting is invoking and it's being set in comparison or contrast, depending on how you look at it, with one of the most famous paintings from the mid 20th century, which is called Christina's World. So I'm actually gonna get out of here and I'm gonna show you that. Um, here is Christina's World. Hopefully you can see that okay. And this is by Andrew Wyeth. Um, now in contrast to Christina's world, of course, where we have a, a white woman who's, who's sprawled perhaps playfully in a grassy field whose, whose world apparently consists of leisure. Whereas in- um, We are sick and tired sorry about that. of being sick and tired. Not sure where that is. Here we go. Uh, so the contrast is, is interesting in that here we have two black women whose lives consist of labor. Here, it seems like there's a white woman whose life consists of leisure. Um, however, uh, what many people don't know or realize is that Christina's world is actually inspired by a woman named Anna Christina Olson, who had a degenerative muscle condition that really cost her the use of her legs um, in her 20s into her, her early 30s. And so in this painting, Wyeth was seeking to do justice to what people have called her conquest of a life, which most people would consider hopeless. And in that sense, we can consider perhaps that Bula's world is um, directly inspired by Christina's world rather than set in contrast to it, given the, the conquest of life in, in a hopeless situation for the, those in situations of slave labor or migrant labor. Okay, next is Woman Washing Clothes by Charles Alston. Uh, Charles Alston was born in 1907 and raised in Charlotte, another Charlottean, very prominent artist. Um, and his father, who was a pastor, often described as the, the Booker T. Washington of Charlotte, uh, but he died, Charles' father died when he was three. And his mother remarried Romare Bearden's uncle, making Charles and Romare Bearden uh, cousins. So when, when he was eight, Charles and his family moved to New York City where he eventually studied art and he became a prominent figure in the Harlem Renaissance. Um, and eventually the first African-American supervisor for the Works Progress Administration's Federal Art Project. Uh, I can talk about Alston all afternoon, um, but uh, encourage you to spend some time just looking at some other examples of his art, given that um, here we have a, a Charlottean artist, an artist who um, was respected within the Harlem Renaissance, but nationally and globally as well. Um, some of his work, or at least one of his works, I believe is down in Spartanburg, South Carolina at the TJC Gallery. Um, I have yet to go see it, but um, sort of sprinkled throughout various collections. And it's wonderful that some of his works are here in Charlotte. This is Haitian Camion by Ellis Wilson. Um, Ellis Wilson was also associated with the Harlem Renaissance, although his work never launched him into fame like some of the other artists. He was able to capture really beautifully the, the vibrancy and the community of, of the African diaspora. Another Hollingsworth here, I already said a lot about him, uh, but like the inscription of this work called African Village says, he's um, combining his skills as an illustrator of comic books with his influence of abstract expressionism, which I think gives his works really unique character. This is Harvest of Shame by Anne, Anne Tanksley. We looked at one of her monotypes earlier here and in contrast to the singular bold red in New Wave, she's still using red. She often uses red in her paintings, um, but here she, she has these bold colors and lines and compositions that's meant to make a sharp contrast between the flowering life of the fields and even the beauty of the clothes with, with the feudal life of, of the slave and migrant labor.
All right, so there's about six works left in this exhibit. They're all by Ernest Cricklow. Um, and so what I want to do, rather than spending some time on each one individually, I'd like to scroll through all of these at once, just spending, giving you some time to appreciate them and to enjoy them. But I want you to see what, um, try to notice what all of these works have in common besides the subject of, of the black woman. So I'm gonna move through them. I'll name the titles and just give you a few moments to observe and see what the commonality is. This is Street Princess. Then we have The Balcony. Next is Woman in a Blue Coat. Um, and the inscription says this is perhaps Cricklow's most well-known painting. What is in common with all of these? This is Suburban Woman. Or Waiting Number Five. And woman in a yellow dress. And finally, this one simply entitled Waiting. I actually believe that all of those have been a part of, of a, a series that he's called Waiting, and they sometimes have other titles as well. Here's a, another shot of that. So stylistically, these works show the far ranging capacity of, of Cricklow as an artist, different styles, right? Um, you'll notice that all of the women in these works show uh, sort of pensive countenance. Um, and, and in contrast to Elizabeth Catlett's Head of Women, there's something very different. In fact, see if I can go back to that at the beginning. So remember this, it's the difference between head of woman here and Cricklow's paintings. I guess I'm gonna have to go all the way through again, aren't I? Well, the most obvious difference is that head of a woman, the woman's looking directly at us as the audience. Whereas in these last five or six paintings that we've seen, they're, they're looking off to the side, off to the side, off to the side, off to the side, and each one of these. And some critics have surmised that, um, <clears throat> that Cricklow himself was, was really not able to handle the gaze of a strong black woman. Uh, it's coming from feminist critics and others um, and perhaps some of that is going on here, but I, I think that something a bit more complex is, is going on in how he's portraying these women. Um, this, is, this last description explains uh, that Cricklow often used barbed wire, railings or banisters, we've seen that in, in, in those last few images, to evoke entrapment. Um, the entrapment of black women of various ages in various settings. But at the same time, he is portraying them beautifully as strong and resolute, meditative, and thoughtful. Um, and, and rather than being confronted by their gaze, I believe that Cricklow is inviting us instead to enter into their situation, to enter into their thought process, to look where they are looking, to take up their perspective, um, and essentially to stand in solidarity with their experience. And this is precisely the invitation offered by Walker Barnes in her book, I Bring the Voices of My People. So I'd like to return there just for a minute. She writes this toward the end of the book. She writes, for Christians engaged in racial reconciliation in particular, Solidarity is based upon our shared identity as followers of Christ who are bound together through our baptismal covenant. 
Thus, our solidarity must be evinced by what Dwayne Bidwell identifies as characteristics of helpful and healthful covenant partnerships. And she lists them this way. Relational justice, or the sharing of power, opportunity, and reward. Number two, equal regard, an ethic of interdependent mutuality in which partners empathize with and seek the flourishing of one another. Number three, mutual empowerment, the capacity to influence and be influenced by others without domination or without losing one's identity. Number four, respect of embodiment, honoring the body of the other, including their lived realities as a reliable and trustworthy informant about them and the world and even the divine. And number five, resistance to colonization, working to prevent and dismantle the internalization of harmful cultural beliefs. I'll say those again, because I think it's really good, even as we consider the gift that art like this can be for us in our spiritual formation journey, that is helping us to embrace solidarity, is helping us to consider the, the characteristics of healthful covenant relationships which include relational justice, equal regard, mutual empowerment, respective embodiment, and resistance to colonization. And Walker Barnes goes on to say, moreover, for men of color, white women and white men to stand in solidarity with women of color and for us to stand in solidarity with one another, requires them to adopt an ethic of caring, uh, a position of receptivity, trust, and empathy toward the truths that women of color tell, as well as the emotional expressiveness with which they tell it. So even as we've gone through this exhibit today, my, my hope is that we have um, been receiving this and enjoying this as a part of that journey, as a part of that journey of adopting an ethic of caring and a position of receptivity and trust and empathy. In this case, especially toward the truth and experience of women of color. And my hope is that you've, you've received a little glimpse of the formative potential of art and just visual art in this case, um, in our journey of faith and in our journey toward rac racial reconciliation. Artists are a profound gift to the church and uh, we need them more than ever. Uh, in fact, we have a little more time. I didn't know how long that, that was gonna take. So I'm just gonna bring us on over to uh, the other exhibit, just to tease you a bit um, and encourage you to check that one out as well. Um, one second and I'll get that back. Okay. So welcome to Brook Hill, just to give you a sense for what this is like. Um, Alvin Jacobs, who's a local photographer, and he spent um, many months actually just living and uh, interacting and enjoying life with people in the Brook Hill community. And he's able to show um, the beauty uh, that is in this neighborhood. <clears throat> having trouble advancing this. Let me try this again. There we go. May not be able to do full screen. I'll just do it like this. So I love his statement here and the beginning of his exhibit. He says that a camera has always been a conversation piece for me. When used properly, it provides a lens through which the artist, his subject, and the viewer seek understanding. And I think that connects with what Walker Barnes is encouraging us to, um, in terms of standing in solidarity, of having this, um, uh, this receptivity and, and attentiveness to learn. Now, the responsibility of a photographer goes far beyond that complexity of setting energy, much like light is reflective and great relationships are built upon trust. Brookhill Village 
is a neighborhood, much like every other geographical area, made up of strong families who take care of each other, children who play and adults who work only a few miles from the heart of a booming city center. The residents became my friends. I saw their strength, resilience, and determination throughout the creative process, and I'm forever grateful for the beautiful stories this amazing community allowed me to tell. Here are some of those stories. Brook Hill Village, again, is at the corner of Remount and Tryon. So he's entering people's homes and encountering their, their stories, their strength, and their burdens. It says here, renters represent a little under half of all households in Charlotte, but account for almost 70% of cost burdened households. Miss Lockett and her family were at home this evening enjoying the lighter moments of an award show. Their living room is full of life. Like many other living rooms in Brook Hill Village, Miss Lockett and other residents in the community consider themselves an actual village. Some images of those who live there. And a view from the porch. Brook Hill Village is located close to the city center. It's on a bus line. And most importantly, its rent is in the right price range for many of its residents. So a lot of the debate around Brook Hill Village is, is how to maintain affordable housing in Charlotte. And um, sometimes the out of control scenarios of developers coming in and wanting to um, frankly just make money off the property rather than maintaining opportunities for affordable housing. Uh, so there's one developer currently who is seeking to to maintain that and it's a, it's a up and down story, um, but with some um, hopeful good end in sight for what Brook Hill Village can become. And for the children there, of course, this is all they know. This is their neighborhood. These are their people. Um, and our desire is that they would not have to face displacement. Again, in these photos, he's capturing the joy. He's capturing the humanity. He's capturing the life um, that, that so often is easy, even, even as we um, follow the news and are influenced by the media, it can be so easy to have certain uh, stereotypes, prejudices, viewpoints of certain parts of our city. Um, and so Alvin Jacobs, through his beautiful photography, is seeking to dismantle those. And in several interviews, um, that I listened to of Alvin Jacobs. He talked particularly about his friendship with um, Van Two-Face Anthony um, and really enjoying his story and his role as a father in Brook Hill Village um, as he seeks to take care as a single dad uh, of his daughter. Here's again, my daughter was born here I conceived her here and we're still here. I thought she would grow up here, but it doesn't look like it. And there, this was um, back in 2018, it was really looking like um, that uh, the affordability would not continue, that a developer would come in and, and, and all of these houses would just be destroyed. Um, since then, there's been some changes due to a lot of advocacy, a lot of solidarity um, and a lot of activism on their behalf. Some demolition has happened um, as they're even starting to um, make way for the new affordable housing that they hope to build. A picture of some of the residences. And a lot of this discussion around Brook Hill, of course, is, has a long history of, of redlining and other real estate inequalities. I started with that quote from Jennings, um, but it's good for us as, as Christians to realize that um, our discipleship drives us to want to care about uh, real estate and care about housing for our neighbors. Um, it says here that mapping inequality offers unprecedented online access to the National Collection of Security Maps and area descriptions uh, that show us how redlining 
happened. Um, so HOLC recruited mortgage lenders, developers, and real estate appraisals in all of these cities to create color-coded credit worthiness maps, uh, risk maps based on neighborhood um, neighborhoods. And these maps and their accompanying documentation helped set the rulers for nearly a century of real estate practice of, of giving loans to only certain types of people in certain types of the cities. And mapping inequality illustrates vividly the interplay between racism, administrative culture, economics, and the built environment. Well said. You know what's so sad, man? You know what's wild? Again, some of the kids that call Brook Hill home and the beauty of, of them. So I hope you can um, take some more time at some point to enjoy those exhibits in person when we are able to um, actually see these exhibits in person. But for now, the Gantt Center has done such a beautiful job of offering that to us, um, as well as some other virtual uh, ways of interacting with their work. So you can check out those on their website as well. Um, it's been such a privilege and honor to be with you today and, and to be um, talking about this art that, uh, again, I pray uh, can be formative in our lives in this um, cultural moment as well when we are seeking to uh, take our discipleship forward in the area of racial reconciliation and, and receptivity. Um, and thank you for joining this event today, uh, making it a priority. Um, I'd love to end our time with a prayer and a blessing as we turn our attention to what is next in our day. So would you pray with me? Lord God of all creation, we praise you for the beauty of this world, the beauty of human beings who are made in your image and the art that we create. Thank you for the work of the artists that we've looked at today, for the passion represented there for the stories, for the creativity, for the gift that it is to us to be able to understand and to experience and to know um, some of these stories. It's, it's a huge privilege, God. Um, pray that by your spirit, you would continue to make us empathetic people, curious people, attentive people who want to show your love to our neighbors, uh, to be uh, courageous in standing in solidarity with those who have often experienced uh, marginalization. Thank you for the gift that art is to help us realize some of these things, to tell the truth slant, to reshape some of our emotions, to give us new visions of what you are doing in the world and, and what could be. Thank you for the wisdom of someone like Shaniqua Walker Barnes, who can help us understand the importance of so many different perspectives and the black women perspective when it comes to knowing you and, and moving forward together in reconciliation. Um, pray that we continue to learn, continue to be open to what you are doing. And so may the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into these doors. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>